welcome everybody to RAG this evening. Um, we're delighted to be hosting Dr. Dasha Bombiakova. Um, Dasha, we first got to know when she came as an exchange student to University of East London about 12 years ago. And I think when she found out about uh, some of radical anthropology's ideas, perhaps that inspired her to go to UCL uh, with Jerome Lewis and do 18 months of fieldwork with the Bayaka on the question of uh, socialization, cultural transmission of norms in a highly egalitarian society. And the, tonight's talk will be drawing on that work and developing that work. So uh, let me hand over to uh, Dasha straight away. Thank you, Dasha. Thank you so much, Kamala, for this lovely introduction. I have to admit that uh, RAG had actually a crucial uh, key impact on the decisions that you mentioned, because in 2010, during the you know, um, um, study exchange, uh, in London at the, at the UEL, uh, when you invited me to go to the RAC lecture that evening, uh, Jerome Lewis spoke, and, and I don't know if you remember, but after after that class, I went to him and I said I, I would I would be uh, absolutely thrilled to you know pursue a PhD there, and with your help and with his help, I was able to to get there. So I'm absolutely this is this is um, this is absolutely key to. To who I am now, so I am. I am endlessly. Um, how do I say? I, I would like to say, say thank you. I am indebted uh, completely. <laughs> I don't know how to say it in English. I didn't speak in English for some time. So I will start now. I will share my presentation um, on a full screen, so we can uh, so we can see it. So currently, I am. Um, I'm, you know, I conducted PhD at the UCL, as, uh, as Camilla mentioned, but currently I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Communist University in Bratislava, Slovakia, where I'm actually, um, where I'm sitting now in Slovakia right now. And as I said, I'm really grateful that I could be talking uh, tonight from Slovakia, that online version of the talk is even possible. I'm uh, leading an NGO, non-governmental organization uh, of uh, Slovak Association of Social Anthropologists here in Bratislava in Slovakia. And we bring together uh, students who are interested in uh, non-academic uh, positions and we are trying to do more applied anthropology and um, just to bring people together who are interested in anthropology in general and in ethnography and do some change, actual change in the society. So these are a few words about me. Tonight, I'm going to talk about uh, Bayaka. Um, you know, Bayaka are, um, you know, most commonly known under the name pygmies, but this is uh, a derogatory term. Um, and, um, you know, scholars uh, are trying to, uh, you know, stop using it. But, you know, when you, when you look up uh, the word pygmy in the Oxford English Dictionary, you might, you might still find references to the so-called uh, short statured people of Central uh, Africa and so on. We are trying to get rid of the term, but it's absolutely, uh, it's, it's just um, painful uh, in what a mess it is and how to overcome it. Because if you mention uh, Bayaka, nobody understands who are, you are talking about, you know, unless, you know, people have the background or um, when you say, you know, you make that reference uh, by the term uh, pygmy, but it's still. It's not, uh, not a good one. So Bayaka were called, uh, I, will, I will be using Bayaka from now on and I will also get to why did I choose this term. Uh, they were called by million names. I mean, uh, here are just a few examples of how different uh, groups were uh, referred to and it's, and it's as I mentioned, a uh, terrible mess. But mm, this, this illustration that I have given here that was painted by my sister, uh, is uh, portraying uh, Gerano Maki, which is uh, um, an ancient portrayal of the battle between uh, pygmies and cranes. And you can, you can find in mythologies of, uh, you know, different um, cultures all over the world, uh, these fascinations with short statured people and so on. So it's uh, it's 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 maybe this preoccupation uh, uh, with the shortness that uh, you know people dealt with over centuries that 
you know, maybe that's why um, there has been so much attention on it. So when people were trying to um, um, avoid the term pygmy, uh, sometimes uh, it turned out not that well. For example, I'm, I'm mentioning here, um, I'm mentioning an example um, uh, that mentioned, uh, was mentioned in the publication by Kilian Hatz, uh, where Batwa actually means main member of a neighborhood uh, despised tribe. It's not always lucky um, when you want to, you know, avoid uh, et uh, ethnonyms, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'll move on now. So I, I'm using the term Bayaka because I'm following the tradition of uh, John Lewis. Uh, you can uh, read his and Alex Kohler's paper from 2001, uh, where, um, where the authors discuss uh, why is it uh, good to replace the term pygmy with uh, bayaka. And um, it is because, you know, there are many, many different, um, you know, hunter-getter um, groups of Central Africa that have different names, but um, it's really hard to find a term that would uh, denote the shared cultural link between them. And bayaka is such a term, that's why I'm using it. So, as I mentioned, there are many, many different groups. Uh, we shouldn't be thinking that Bayaka is just one homogenous group uh, of uh, people who are, you know, acting and doing um, and thinking uh, and living in the same way. There are actual differences, so we should also be aware of that. Um, these, uh, these, these groups are sometimes referred to as, as foragers or hunter-getters, well, not, uh, not sometimes, but quite often. <laughs> And uh, the problem, the problem I have with the term foragers is that it uh, denotes, uh, it, it means that a person is searching for food by uh, accident almost, which is not the case uh, for, for Bayaka groups. So I prefer the word hunter-getter, even though I have, um, you know, I have some reservations when it comes to uh, labeling people by their, uh, you know, key economic uh, production activities. Uh, it's sometimes, uh, you know, it doesn't tell the whole story. They are not only hunting and gathering. There are some groups do a little bit of farming. So, um, you know, many groups engage in trading. They do work for different companies. There is a big, uh, you know, uh, th there is more to it than just hunting and gathering. And also we shouldn't be, um, under, um, you know, we should, we should be also thinking of um, the importance or the impact of, or the extent of, uh, how much uh, these groups interact and work with uh, foreigners like us, anthropologists, medics, tourists, people who are coming, uh, passing by and so on. So um, this is just also something to be aware of. So um, when it comes to um, key um, economic uh, activities, so the usually it's mentioned hunt, that they are hunting and gathering. But uh, when it comes to key cultural values in terms of genders, I would, I would rather say that hunting and mothering is the key thing that these people engage in. Also in the literature, you will often uh, find remarks on uh, semi-nomadism. It actually, when I was uh, going through archival materials, I found that uh, nomadism was one of the first things uh, people mentioned in their correspondences. Now, when I say people, I mean, uh, you know, Westerners uh, who were writing their diaries and corresponded with, uh, with their families in Europe, for example. And they were, you know, remarking on the nomadism and how hard it is to reach them that they are unreachable and how much they would love to see them, but they are simply unreachable because they are nomadic. So these were some of the first, uh, mm, I mean, references uh, to, to Bayaka in the area that comes in, you know, that could be said like in 1880s, 1890s and so, and so on. Another key um, or kind of common characteristic or explanation or description of uh, uh, different Bayaka groups that you will encounter uh, with, within the written accounts, you will find that, uh, you know, they live alongside uh, non-Bayaka uh, groups there is a big uh, mess also when it comes to how to refer to these groups. Some um, refer to, to them by their language. So they would say, for example, they are Bantu speaking people or, the, or there are others who would refer to, uh, to them by their uh, key economic uh, activity, for example, farming, or um, some would refer to them um, according to their, you know, 
for example, their height, like that they're tall. You know, I mean, uh, there is also a big, um, um, there is no consensus of how to approach to call these different groups and it's extremely messy. So how did I come to, uh, to get to Congo? I think I have seen Jerome uh, Lewis here, so I would like to say hi. Um, I actually, um, uh, Jerome Lewis was my supervisor uh, when I was conducting my PhD at uh, UCL. And um, uh, this is the grant. Uh, this is the, the, the grant that it was funded by. And my, uh, my key um, interest was in understanding how children learn um, you know, by account norms and values. And we, um, we looked at uh, different cultural institutions, uh, one of cultural institution of public speaking, which is Mosambo, another one of public uh, of ridicule, which is Moajo, and play Masana. Uh, and I was interested in how uh, this, uh, um, you know, um, how within this, uh, within the context of these institutions, how do we, how, how do Bayaka children learn uh, Bayaka norms? So I did 18 months uh, immersive field work um, and I, um, the, the most uh, important or the core um, methodology was participant observation. Um, I learned the local languages, mostly Yaka, which is categorized as uh, Bantu Sitan language. And I did, I, I did learn some uh, Lingala, which is a local trade language. And um, yeah, I, I put uh, here this note. And since, uh, since the last talk, I made a promise to myself that I would mention it and, um, each time I will be giving a talk that um, uh, this was a long-term field work, which was quite dangerous. And some of my behaviors as a student was quite reckless, which almost uh, led to my death. So I would just like to warn other students if um, you know if anyone is going to be uh, listening to this that uh, health is absolutely key and crucial and should go first and nobody should be waiting to get the help for any reasons. So this is just what I would like to uh, say on the side uh, and I made myself this promise. So this is the area uh, where I did the research, which is um, um, when you look uh, when you look here. So this is Congo Brazzaville. Um, here on the north, there is a department called Likwala, and within this department, um, there, there is this a river called Motaba. So uh, my research was uh, based on the village, in the village called Jube or Bobanda, which is a, um, a village quite typical to the uh, Motaba area. Um, yeah. Uh, so Jube or Bobanda is a village uh, that is like on the on the shore on the riverbanks of Motaba River, and is divided into two neighborhoods. One is called Nugele and another Pete. I stayed in the Pete neighborhood, and uh, um, yeah, there is um, just just to give you a sort of explanation. Uh, um, so th there is a. Uh, uh, Cocoa plantation. There are cocoa plantations. Um, there is there are raffia palms. Swamp forest is in the area, and um, usually these villages, as I mentioned, there are those neighborhoods, and those neighborhoods are even more separate. So there is always a part where uh, or an area where where Bayaka live, and there is always um, a different segregated area where where the others non Bayaka population lives. Um, in the case of, sorry, in the case of uh, Jube, uh, these so-called others or uh, non-Bayaka uh, are called uh, Bondongo or Bandongo. Uh, uh, Bayaka refer to them as Bilo. Um, they have really, uh, they have antagonistic relationship. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's really hard to, to, to describe, um, you know, in a, in a few minutes what this relationship is like, but um, it's more sort of like a patron client relationship where, where uh, Bilo act as uh, pseudo parents and Bayaka as pseudo children. And, um, you know, Bilo keeps asking uh, their children to do labor in exchange for food and protection. Um, but um, there is this, um, I would say this antagonism or hatred and tension 
is uh, talked, for example, in the Bayaka group, in the Bayaka community, very openly uh, in front of the children and children are encouraged to, to uh, you know, um, to behave uh, in certain ways that, you know, you should be behaving in front of your patrons, so-called. It, it's really complex to get into the detail, but uh, there is quite a hatred there. Um, uh, Bayaka are uh, gender egalitarian. Um, I mean, um, I, I, I won't again uh, go to too much of a detail, but uh, what I would like to say is that uh, in, an, in an egalitarian society, um, everyone has uh, um, takes, takes responsibility on his or her own shoulders when it comes to uh, pursuing Aung's uh, will or decisions or um, opinions as to what the group should be doing um, on economic decisions, on political decisions. People um, take uh, responsibility and act uh, on behalf of what they believe. And uh, this is how I felt it's, uh, uh, you know, to live in an egalitarian society is a little bit exhausting for a person from a Western society where we just sit back and um, you know, wait for others to do things for us. Yes, we elect uh, representatives, but you know, it's some kind of a lazy uh, attitude in a way. Um, another, another characteristic or key value is personal autonomy. Uh, people respect each other's autonomy, which means that, um, uh, for example, in daily decision-making people, you know, enjoy a lot of freedom including children in terms of what people want to engage in what types of what types of activities they want to engage in i mean there are there are of course um, limits uh, as to you know certain things sometimes have to be done or uh, you know if there is a conflict or there is a problem people have to you know get together and make some decisions but it's not coercive there are always some choices that uh, people can choose to do throughout the day and they are not punished for their decisions unless they are not harming somebody else. I put uh, personal autonomy in, a, a, how do you call this, uh, quotes, uh, because I found personal autonomy a little bit uh, problematic term. Um, you know, in the literature, you can find on the one hand that um, defin definitions that go somewhere along the lines that um, everybody can do what they want this is exaggerated, okay, but everybody can do what they want. And on the other hand, there, there are decisions that nobody can cause others. And uh, there is not, I, I don't find a very clear, um, it, it's not very clear when you're reading, for example, ethnographies of different hunter-gatherers and, you know, people are referring to personal autonomy. I'm not sure sometimes if we are referring to the same thing. Now, demand sharing. Demand sharing is, um, um, is a recipient controlled uh, type of sharing of material goods where uh, people ask for, you know, those who demand are in the right, uh, which means that people are obligated to give uh, and hand over the item when it's, uh, when it's asked for. Um, uh, this is a very uh, gendered uh, society. Uh, children from early age uh, engage in different activities. I mean, nobody is restricted um, when it comes to children, especially uh, when it comes to, you know, um, activities that are assigned to women or men, but um, you, you can tell from early on that uh, even the games are um, divided uh, by gender that they have, you know, they, they work uh, uh, in, it's a, it's a gendered society. But what I found up, uh, absolutely intriguing and very uh, encouraging, and uh, that's um, uh, something I'm inspired by in my own life, also when it comes to raising my own child, is uh, what I found like I found that Bayaka children are absolutely satisfied there uh, when it comes to their. I mean, people, people there are absolutely satisfied with their gender identity, I would call it. I know this is a foreign term. I don't have any precise term how I would describe it, but people are constantly reminded of how, how great it is that you are a woman because, you know, men are rubbish, but this is, this is perfect. You are a woman. This is perfect. And, and at the same time, on the other hand, the same would be told to boys. Uh, uh, so it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And I think that um, it, it helps when it comes to, uh, you know, when you have a highly, uh, highly gendered society, when it comes to, you know, 
roles when it comes to work. Um, it makes you, it makes you, I don't know, it, it, you can tell that there is some sort of satisfaction about it. I, I, I don't have, I don't know how to explain it. Um, and there is uh, extremely strong female group solidarity that I haven't encountered in any um, other, either in, in my life. Um, but I will be talking about that later when I will be talking about Mojo. So today I will, I will talk about Mosambo, Mojo, and then I will talk about noise. Mosambo is a public speaking, uh, Mojo is a public mocking theater. I will be introducing these two uh, cultural institutions and then I will turn to noise. So what is Mosambo? Mosambo was uh, uh, described, I mean, my work is, uh, you know, drawing heavily on the work of Jerome Lewis of my supervisor. And I kind of extended on some of, uh, you know, I, 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 I hope that I moved it at least a little bit uh, further. Um, Mosambo is a public speaking protocol. Um, it's an organizational and problem solving institution. Uh, Mosambo is, uh, um, is, a, is a speech that a person, a speaker addresses when a, when a person addresses the group. It can happen anytime during the day. Uh, people can, a person can just stand up and, you know, um, if, 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 if uh, it has certain, uh, um, I'm, I think I'm writing it here. So if anything, anything really, any complaint or criticism or commentary or advice can become a Mosambo if it has certain formal characteristics and aesthetic qualities. That's what defines Mosambo. So for example, Mosambo starts by, um, uh, by, um, uh, exclamation, oka, or listen. And when you say that everybody, everybody gets, uh, you get the attention now, and then you can move on and tell what's on your mind or what bothers you or an issue that you need to share. Uh, so um, as, as, as you go on with speech, which is, uh, which is you know, uh, very exaggerated, uh, quite emotional, um, you know, uh, you, you know, the speaker can be, you know, walking through the camp, um, just, uh, you know, the gestures can be quite wild, uh, the sentences can repeat, uh, and uh, it's very assertive, um, and sometimes uh, throughout the speech, the speaker stops for a while and asks, hey, like, uh, are you listening? Buneoka, and uh, they usually say, hey, Buseoka, um, there is, there is there is also this this sort of interaction between uh, you know just the speaker is making sure if he is being listened to, or or for example the speaker can ask like uh, is it is it a lie I'm saying the buanya uh, buanya te so people are you know he's just making sure that everybody is listening because it's important something it's some, there is something very important that he or she wants to share. Um, I think I mentioned, um, I didn't, but I, will, I, will, I meant to say that there are actually people who are specialists in speaking. So for example, if there is somebody more shy or doesn't like to uh, you know, speak in public, um, um, there is a specialist that you can go to and ask the person to, to tell the, uh, the issue on your behalf. Um, um, there are uh, different, sorry, this is, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's, visible enough. Uh, there are different, um, there are different uh, goals to Mosambo. Um, this could be, for example, individual complaints, like uh, somebody uh, took a pot, a uh, cooking pot of yours and didn't return. This could be like individual complaint about certain, certain little things like this. For example, it could be also about organizing. In the morning, somebody could stand up and say, okay, so we have seen uh, this fruit in the forest. We have seen, um, we have seen that these are dead. Or, for example, there should be mushrooms. It was raining. You should uh, children could go there or there. There are some suggestions as to what can be done, or what can be gathered, uh, or if there is, um, you know, any plans when it comes to hunting and so on, or people, you know, organize their activities like this. Um, then could be um, I call it scheming, but. Um, there could be, you know, some problems that, uh, for example, emerged with the villagers or some strangers. So there are some, you know, decisions as to what they can do as a group uh, to overcome the problem. Uh, one of the ones that Mosambo could be, for example, let's, uh, let's, for example, move to this or that camp or let's move over there so nobody can find us. Or, for example, there could be 
I remember there was, for example, issue uh, in the village, there was a, a school which is called uh, Ora School, which is uh, a formal school for uh, Bayaka kids. And um, the teachers were complaining that kids are not uh, coming to the school. Uh, so there were some mosambo about this, like how to overcome this problem so the teacher doesn't bother our children. Uh, but at the same time that uh, there is not much problem, problem, not many problems in the village. So they, they have sent, for example, few kids to the school and some state, and then they were rotating. So for example, this is, this is one, of, uh, one example of such mosambo. Most of the Mosambo is uh, um, either organizing or, or normative. So people judge um, and warn and explain consequences of people's actions. Whenever there is, um, there is either a threat of norm being broken, um, there, is, there is a sign that uh, people are going down the road with some behaviors. Uh, these uh, speeches are there to uh, point to such a behavior and warn uh, that if they don't stop, this and this can happen to the group and so on. Now, there is another which is celebrating and that sometimes sometimes it's like, um, let's say that uh, there was, for example, a really successful hunt, uh, hunting event or there is, for example, um, I don't know, somebody brought a lot of food or got a lot of food then people um, make a speech like, uh, this is absolutely amazing. The group of women got this, the group of men got that. Kids uh, this uh, behaved nicely. Let's, uh, have some, uh, let's have some fun, let's dance, let's have masana. So it's very encouraging. It promotes social uh, you know, pro-social behavior and gives positive feedback to the community and celebrates the, the joyful moments. And there could be also alarming, um, Mosambo, and that's um, when uh, communicating, uh, when, uh, when some really important news need to be communicated. For example, if, uh, I don't know, um, police would be arriving on a canoe and they would hear it from a different village, uh, then, you know, this needs to be, you know, um, the message needs to be sent. So uh, this could be uh, accompanied with uh, whistles or with, um, you know, different type of um, sounds or how I would call it. Uh, this is uh, this is how one of my informants um, explained to me uh, what is Mosambo good for. Mondo mu atambola mu angamu mosuku ame ti dongi tambi ame sanganya ofadiko bo ame fofa Mosambo. So when the issues walk, uh, you know, in people's heads, uh, when you have problems, when something is is in your head, you should be trying to get rid of your negative emotions and how to do that is to get it out and speak out Mosambo. So it also tells how, um, how cathartic this is. And I remember I, I spoke uh, Mosambo several times and uh, I, I, was, I, I didn't expect to be, I, I, was, I was quite stressed before I stood up and had to do that. Then when I, when, I, when I did it, I was complaining about people's behaviors. So I used it on something that they used it. I was shouting. Um, I was, you know, um, really trying to, you know, show my anger fully. Um, and then I was so tired that I didn't care if the problem was solved or not because I was relieved by sharing my problem. So I think Mosambo, um, you know, many times Mosambo in my observation, even many, many times Mosambo is not followed by some kind of further action, uh, you know, a punishment or anything. This is just um, punishment. Um, what I see as a punishment, for example, is that when somebody's, you know, people's actions, you know, how I would say it. There is one example, for example, that um, my key informant Buma, was um, not sharing properly the goods that I gave her, you know, some, some things that she was interested in. I was giving her, because I spent much more time with her than with others, I gave her more things and people got really upset that she was hiding these things. And uh, it got into a point that one day they simply, you know, there were some warnings about it, there were fights, there were, there were Mosambo, but at some point uh, they lost nerve and they just raided the hat and they took the things. 
that's what I would say. This is a punishment and it's different from Mosambo. Mosambo warns and asks people to go and return to, to the, you know, to, to the normal or to the proper Bayaka ways. Um, this is absolutely crucial and I didn't mention it. One should be quiet and listen to Mosambo. So if somebody starts to speak uh, Mosambo, it's absolutely uh, necessary that others listen, even children uh, when they are playing, it's not tolerated. They would ask either go play somewhere else or be quiet and listen. So it's disrespectful to uh, not to, um, to, to talk or to not to listen. And, um, you know, everyone can speak Mosambo. Everyone is allowed to do that, but there are usually certain people who like who like it either more or either have more problems that walk over their heads or um, um, it also requires um, quite a skill and also it's as I mentioned quite difficult it's not that easy as I, I thought so I did see some um, uh, Mosambo spoken by children but it was mostly within their own group uh, among children um, yeah so in my thesis, I, you know, I talk about what issues uh, were discussed when it comes to Mosambo uh, towards children. So here are the examples. And um, I don't know how much I need to watch my time. Okay. Um, uh, here is one example of, uh, of Mosambo. Um, in Jube, there is a large plantation of cocoa trees owned by Bilo. Bilo value and take care of these trees because they receive a cash income by selling the cocoa seeds. Once a group of Bayaka children was playing in, the, in those trees. Firstly, they just climbed up and sang while sitting on the high branches. But Dokoji had an idea to take a machete and began cutting the trees. Other children excitedly followed him. Most of the parents were in the forest or in the gardens. The grandmother who was taking care of them drank too much palm wine and fell asleep. By the time she woke up, the children had already cut down several trees. Stop that noise. But the children ran around laughing about the grandmother's inability to catch them. A lot of alcohol, a lot of alcohol. The grandmother explained to me that there will be a problem with Bilo and send an um, adolescent girl, Mado, to deliver a message to her parents. The plan was to hide for some time in the forest till the problem was less fresh. We packed our stuff and walked to the nearest camp. Later, other adults joined us and we walked further. While walking, women and men spoke their complaints loudly about the unnecessary problems caused by the children. We have arrived at one camp, which had been abandoned, abandoned for a longer time. So everyone began cleaning and preparing the place and children were very quiet and helped in cleaning automatically without any demand from others. And in the evening, men were sitting on their banjo, which is a men's sitting area, and talked to, uh, to each other about the problem. And later, Mabota stood up and spoke very seriously, addressing the children. So listen, children, play slowly, slowly, slowly. We would not want our children to be similar to Bilo. Noise, noise, noise. Disorder is not good, never. We don't want to be hungry. We want to find food. The forest will close. The forest will close. I am done. So this is, um, uh, I'm, I'm showing just one example, so, so I manage with time. Um, and um, if there will be more time, I can read some more examples, but I will move on now to Moajo. Moajo are uh, female public mocking reenactments. Um, usually it's performed by women. Um, um, and as, as I mentioned before, I'm drawing um, heavily on the work of Jerome Lewis, uh, who introduced, um, who was talking about Moajo. And I, um, in the field, I followed these examples and I watched uh, what's going on during Mojo performances. Um, the point of Mojo, as, as, a John, as Jerome uh, mentions or describes is uh, that the person in question, the person who mis misbehaved at some point, at, at, at something or, you know, behaved ridiculously in some way or uh, broke a norm or, acted silly that uh, you know the name of the wrongdoer is not mentioned but the women reenact those actions uh, and make the person um, you know it's like make the person laugh at himself even though laugh at himself is uh, not always uh, the result of it um, but at least Mojo is showing some kind of a mirror to the person in question and shows the person how he or she behaved in a way and 
I don't know if I'm kind of making um, circles here. Um, Buma, my key informant, informant um, explained it like Moajo Afedia Mendo Mabatona Miso. And this is actual, absolutely crucial. Moajo shows uh, people's behaviors and, you know, in, in these performances that, you know, no words are needed. You, you express uh, something absolutely, um, you know, through Moajo you can express things without words. And this is, I think, really interesting also when it comes to uh, children's learning, social norms, because um, even, you know, those children who cannot, you know, speak well yet, uh, or, you know, um, I mean, it can be really effective too uh, when it comes to teaching values and norms. <clears throat> so Jerome mentions normative, um, normative Moajo, uh, but I would also like to talk about Moajo being used in different contexts. So um, one thing is to show someone's misbehavior, but there are also Moajo because it's so funny and um, you know it's, it's it's a fun thing to do. Um, in um, uh, women often do it for different reasons as well. Um, so I'm mentioning, for example, coalitionary Moajo, which is uh, which often happens during the you know. Um, women's uh, gathering trips uh, in the forest when they're taking a break. Uh, some of them are breastfeeding children, they are chatting, there is lots of gossiping and they will be gossiping about things. And, you know, many times it just breaks into, uh, into Moajo, into some sort of uh, performance. And uh, uh, they, would, they would, for example, um, exaggerate some sort of characteristics of certain groups. Um, it's, uh, it's affirming shared opinions, for example, laughing about men in general and their sexual behavior, laughing at uh, foreigners and their incapability to walk through the forest, laughing at children and their, uh, you know, clumsy um, way of, I don't know, digging yams. It could be anything like this. And then uh, there is uh, next uh, context or type of mojo, which is, which I call gender competition, where, um, these are um, very strong and powerful public performances, usually in front of, in front of men when they are really harshly mocking men. Uh, and these are often uh, accompanied by uh, really uh, strong words as well. And with some, um, how do I call it? Um, So it could be either this, this much performance, it could be either planned or they can emerge spontaneously. There are no rules to this. There is just, you know, somebody starts and others uh, get in. There are no boundaries between, there, there, are, there are very fluid boundaries between audience and uh, those people who participate because um, you, can, you, can, you can perform a part, join in the group and perform something, but at the same time, you cannot step back and comment on the, on the behaviors of others as you step out of that role and you talk about people's performance or you encourage them to continue. And then you again, switch back to the role and continue. There are different ways of how to do Moajo and there are no absolute strict rules. And uh, yeah, uh, there are also, there are, there are women who, uh, who like to perform it uh, much more you know, common. I remember in one village that I visited uh, along the Motaba River, uh, there was a woman who was absolutely, uh, who sh she loved doing Moajo like almost every day. It was really funny. I, I sometimes I was thinking, why did I, didn't I stay in that village? <laughs> um, when it comes to, uh, yeah, so these are some of the examples of how uh, audience can interact uh, with, the, with the performers. So there's a come on, share us some more, or, you know, share your thing. Um, you know, it's, you know, at the same time, uh, there could be also some kind of warnings, like it's, 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 it's enough. Like, I mean, the person has laughed, the person in question has, uh, laughed already or you know it's enough or you have we have repeated enough so sometimes there is unwritten it's, it's unwritten rule, definitely unwritten rule on you know sometimes it's enough enough is enough so some women uh, say okay we should 
stop that. Um, yeah, I mean, like uh, there could be, for example, that there could be examples when somebody starts a mojo, but at the same time, there is no response. And without that response, there is no longer mojo because, you know, you do it along with the audience. So something like a, one person performing something without any direct engagement of the audience, that, that's not mojo. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't have to be a literal, literal uh, reenactments of people's actions that were, for example, wrong. When we talk about normative uh, mojo, it could be metaphoric. For example, if there is somebody who didn't share food, um, you, we can refer to non-sharing actions uh, in a different way. Um, we can point to different attributes and characteristics um, of the problem. And here I, here I'm mentioning one example. Um, Elder Bobila left the camp in order to labor for Bilo. He received a gun, cigarettes, and a few bullets to kill several bikers and monkeys for this Bilo family. He left his and his wife and children left with him. After a week, the family returned and everything seemed all right until the march unfolded. Buma was the only actor in the performance. She imitated Bobila by sitting in his typical way, stroking her belly as though it were full of food and pretending to hold a pipe and smoke. She appeared to have trouble standing, emphasizing how full belly was. And uh, when she tried to sit down, she rolled onto the floor. So she was she was just um, she was just showing that he didn't share food. That's why he's so full. That's the point that I was trying to make. Um, now, many times these um, these performances, and this also counts for, for example, when people are. Uh, performing and retelling and singing stories, um, these um, reactions, they don't need to be with words. Like, for example, here I said kaba, like share, give us more. These are, these are actual words, uh, actual demands, but uh, reactions oftentimes are uh, taking a form of interjections um, that are um, hard to, you know, they don't they don't they carry meaning but it's hard to you know they imitate the sounds of something so um you know i like for example this one this squishy sounds bojo bojo um which um, is for example when you're you know when there is for example somebody is telling when somebody is impersonating or performing that somebody is cooking something or walking through the mat for example so there's this squishy sound so um yeah so I don't know if somebody can tell me how much time I do I have left. I'm a little bit lost. Um, so I know, please Camila or someone tell me. Dacha, just ca carry on, just keep going. You can go after half past seven if you've got lots of material, it's fine. It, okay. it, it's lovely stuff, so just go on. Thank you, you are very kind. Another um, 25 minutes, if that's good. Okay, um, it will be less than that. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so here is one more, another example of normative Mosambo, but I'm thinking I will rather go here. So I will talk more about the coalitionary Moajo, uh, which often happen, as I mentioned, in the absence of the people and uh, re, uh, the women reenact re or not reenact, they're mocking uh, stereotype perceptions of individuals or groups. Um, here is, for example, um, <clears throat> these photos are from my thesis. Here is, for example, this is in the village in Jube. Um, uh, these are two Bill of women who came over to, to visit and uh, they started to sing and dance. And uh, for Bayaka, it's often funny for it, it, for the Bayaka I knew for for my informants, it it was often funny the way they they dance. They just were laughing at them uh, about how they dance. So so you can see in these first three pictures that they are dancing and and as soon as uh, the women left, these two uh, Bilo women left, uh, Bayaka women started to repeat their. Um, reenact their um, dancing while they were laughing loudly about it. They were mocking uh, how, you know, uh, the Bill women danced. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, and I would like to emphasize that Moajo is uh, absolutely key to um, 
to you know it, it helps to strengthen the solidarity between women i didn't mention this before but it's absolutely um, important that uh, Bayaka women spend most of the time most of the time together they know um, so much about themselves uh, when it comes to their you know intimate relationships anything i mean that they know so much they they know each other very very well and i find these moajo um, um examples or performances these moments when women were um when we were in the forest and we were uh, you know um uh, engaging in these performances i have really like um it's really nostalgic when i think about it because it was so much so much fun and I felt so connected to them um, and you know there are many other manifestations of you know uh, and also ways to to create and form and enhance um, strong female or you know within the group strong relationships and one of them is for example frequent touch intimacy and closeness I mean I was really shocked uh, when I arrived <laughs> uh, uh, and I had my first in in encounters with Bayaka. I felt really weird because I, you know, I was in front of my tent and I kind of introduced myself. Um, and I tried, anyways. And uh, the the women sat close to me, but there was no, there was not uh, enough space for me to move. I mean, they were like glued on me, and it felt absolutely weird. But at the same time, when I kind of relaxed and didn't think about it it was fine it was okay and um i think it it enhances that that bond and um, um it helps to overcome this kind of it's a, it's a quite an icebreaker um so these 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 uh, female groups are you know uh, another uh, i will be i will be continuing with this list so they they work together they they go to the forest, they help each other when it comes to digging yams, finding food, uh, fishing. Um, they help each other with the child care taking, uh, with breastfeeding. Um, they, um, they are really uh, active when it comes to um, what we would call domestic violence. Um, when there is, you know, relationships uh, even between men and women when they are happening in the camp, whatever you say they would whatever, whatever whatever say there and not in the forest, it's it's a public thing. So uh, disputes that are happening in the in the context of a camp are public. And this includes also this kind of this kind of disputes or fights between men and women. And I mean between couples. And uh, when there is this sort of violence or disputes women are stepping in and interfere with it because it's also it feels almost like this is their thing to to deal with too so there is this uh help uh that others can other women can rely on which is uh, very inspiring and um uh, there is there is uh, there are more kind of joyful moments of uh, beauty enhancements they um there were there were mornings when we spent a lot of time just taking care of ourselves and it's not that i was just taking care of myself but uh, somebody did my hair i mean removed lice from my hair or braided my hair and um, i helped others with similar things not with the lice but uh, with the hair uh, with, the, with the braids um and then there are also, I, I encountered many times, for example, when there were different Bayaka women uh, or families or, you know, bigger groups going through the village and or passed by our camp, they stopped, they sat down, they talked with each other. They, they, they always talked like, okay, so you are from there or there, or do you know this person? Do you know that person? We are a family and so on. They would exchange bracelets uh, or they, you know, they would chat, they would sit very closely to each other, even if they don't know each other. So, uh, yeah, this is also, there is, there is also this sort of kind of general uh, mm, solidarity to women, even with those that are not actual part of the, the social group. And there is, of course, a lot of chatting, gossiping, joking, um, lots of lots of gossip. And there is also uh, sound synchronism, uh, which I don't know the specific word for it, uh, but there, I know that there exists. I just cannot find it nowhere in my notes. I was 
going through my filter notes many times to find it. So there is this um, there is this specific sound that um, uh, women as a group can create can make together. Um, I don't know how I would describe it, uh, but uh, simply it, it it involves um, a lot of knowing each other to to kind of balance and do it at the same time. Um, yeah, so this physical closeness, uh, I mean, it's it's everywhere in the literature. People keep uh, mentioning this, how how uh, it's common among different Bayaka groups. Um, um, and this, you know, these <laughs> these conversations are getting sometimes really uh, funny. This is this is one of the uh, conversations um, that I mentioned also in my thesis uh, when they're, you know, that they're really talking uh, really badly about their husbands. I mean, when when they arrive, that they're they're fine, but uh, uh, the uh, the conversations are always like how how rubbish they are and uh, how pointless uh, everything is and how no meat there has been no meat for so long and so on. So they uh, they they talk like that. Um, yeah, this is just uh, one illustration from my thesis. Uh, oftentimes, um, women use, uh, uh, you know, kitchen utensils um, as beating um, tools to prevent from, you know, to prevent, for example, uh, violent encounters between men and women, but that's just an illustrative material. Yeah, and here um, I mention in more detail um, about some uh, beauty enhancing strategies. Um, there is so many. Uh, lots of you know techniques of uh, making scars and incisions, tattoos, um, applica applications of pigment, piercing, uh, eyebrows shaving, different types of uh, fashions. Where when it comes to eyebrows shaving, and this change over time, and um, they um, you know it, it's it's not it's not only it's not only uh, visual, many times they're using substances that uh, have magical and power, uh, powerful uh, uh, potents that they, mm -hmm. they use, for example, when it comes to love magic. Because, you know, I you remember I mentioned um, autonomy uh, as one of the key values, respecting one's uh, autonomy when it comes to key values of Bayaka. And this counts also when it comes to um, um, in, in the relationships, for example, when, when a husband goes somewhere for, for a long time, you are not allowed to make uh, that husband feel, you know, like you are not allowed to make him feel guilty for going away and uh, make, you know, uh, some sort of comments that, uh, you know, oh, you're leaving me or something like that, or make big, you know, do some performance with big tears or anything like that. You are not supposed to interfere in this sort of decisions of others, and this uh, this also applies when it comes to romantic relationships. and And they uh, uh, they they use these uh, cosmetics and uh, magic uh, to to bring their husbands back, but not by guilting them or by threatening them or by making you know jealousy um, performances or anything like that. But I will. I'm uh, kind of moving away a little bit from um, what I was, what I meant to uh, to talk about today. So I will move on uh, uh, because I would like to go to noise. You know, when I was when I was analyzing my data for my PhD thesis, and I looked at in countries uh, examples of uh, Mosambo and Moajo. I realized that I was trying to employ, you know, Western categories when it comes to classification of what are the topics of the, you know, Mosambo. And I would say, okay, making a disorder, um, criticizing sexual behavior, you know, and I was, you know, kind of putting these labels there. But then when I when I went, went through my material again and again, I realized that actually what these people are, all the, for example, in, in Mosambo, what they're talking about is, is actually noise. And this is nothing new. I mean, it has been, uh, talk, uh, you know, uh, Colin Turnbull talked about it uh, uh, when it comes to Eastern uh, uh, pygmy group Mbuti, where <clears throat> he talks uh, about the importance uh, of noise uh, and the role of noise in the society. So, for example, 
um, he mentions noise kills the forest, noise scares away the hunt, producing noise um, brings unfortunateness to people, noise closes the forest and prevents um, the hunter from being successful to, to get the hunt and so on. Um, I looked at uh, how uh, how my informants, um, you know, in, you know, uh, referred to to noise, and this was this was these these terms were very very common in almost each Mosambo. Motuku means noise, but it's uh, etukuma means heat, but it's also um, a characteristic of noise. Désordre, which is from French. Ambulier, like ombrouille from French. Makelele, that's also another uh, <clears throat> word for noise or disorder. And we could go on like this. Then I looked at all the examples of, not only in Mosambo, uh, not in relation to conversations about Moajo, casual conversation notes. And I looked at examples of noise uh, in my ethnographic uh, fieldwork um, um, notes. And I found these examples, that these are examples of noise and disorder. I will return to this slide soon. But basically, um, any, any time people were doing something that disrupts the well-being of the community or smoothness of the, of the um, community life, or when somebody is going to like makes makes uh, like it, it's visible that he or she is going to do something wrong or either in a wrong place in a wrong time in a wrong way or for wrong reasons people uh, would uh, would mention in the community and doesn't matter uh, what what the age of the person people say hey stop the noise or don't do the noise and they 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 wouldn't say uh, the reason why uh, why they should stop it they said hey, hey this is noise like you stop the noise children will be playing somewhere and they would be uh, i don't know cutting trees and being really noisy they say hey, hey stop the noise or uh, slow down or um, then then in the evening in mosambo people will be uh, repeating repeating this is noisy this is noise i don't want to get hungry i don't want the forest to close i don't want um uh, unfortunateness to bring on people you should stop the noise so people are all the time repeating this and everyone in the community even even little children would would, would tell others to stop the noise and so there is this there is this um there is this uh direct link between noise which is either the actual noise or uh, norm breach or something it is a sign of something dangerous and it has direct impact on the well-being of the group so if a child is crying and nobody's attending to each other hey, hey come on like go and soothe that child we don't do we want us to die so it can get uh, all the way like this so um it's in everyone's interest to soothe the noise and to prevent, uh, to prevent norm uh, breach, um, because it has a direct impact on everyone. So it's like everyone's responsibility to resolve the issue, to, to soothe the child, to uh, make others do things correctly. And at the same time, uh, when people mention, hey, stop the noise, it's like, these are Bayaka values. You, you don't break our values. You don't break our norms. So it's a constant reminder of what those norms are. And I think noise is absolutely crucial to understanding how, how Bayaka values can be you know, reproduced. You know, when you, so I mentioned, it's a constant reminder of norms. It's easy to exercise. I mean, Mosambo is difficult to exercise for children, but this is even easy for children. Children learn the, uh, ch children use, use this very often on adults, on anyone. Um, and uh, it also brings them sort of a um, political satisfaction because you have a little bit of a control. You are also the one who is telling others what, how sh uh, things should be done. And um, uh, real punishment rarely follows, like and this would have to accumulate into something terrible. So it's not even, it's not, I don't know how, how I would say it, but um, I think I find noise to be very crucial when it comes to future studies on understanding reproduction of egalitarian values, on understanding um, norms per se within uh, Central African hunter-gatherer communities, and uh, I think it's worth to go back to Turnbull and um, and also I know Jerome refers 
to many many different examples of uh, um, of noise uh, and also there are points to different um, to in different ethnographies to the importance of noise so if i were to write my thesis now i would i would definitely incorporate noise uh, more more deeply into my an analysis and in the future i would look into it more detail through the lens of noise because that's the lens of bayaka and thank you thank you dasha thank you that, 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 that was fantastic i hope i didn't bore you too much no uh, not at all we could listen for a whole other hour easily always okay. it's a bit uh, <laughs> it's hard work um so uh I'm sure people have a lot of, of questions and thoughts out of that. Um, does does anybody want to come up with a question or comment for Dasha straight away? Anybody you'd like to um, develop? I don't know if Jerome or Ingrid want to follow in there or I was I yeah, I, I I'll just start. Um, oh, Jerome is going. Go, go, Jerome. Go on. Go on. Can you hear me? Yeah, now yeah. Okay. It's very lovely to see you, Jerome. Yeah, lovely to see you, and so lovely to hear what you've been doing, Dasha. I really enjoyed <laughs> being reminded of your rich, uh, wonderful ethnography. Thank um, you. Yeah, really, so nice. I do hope uh, you're going to start publishing soon because I want to be able to quote you. And, okay, uh, <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> Good. Um, no, just a couple of points on naming, which is obviously a, 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 an area. The mm -hmm. simple solution, I think, is just to talk about Central African hunter gatherers, mm -hmm. and uh, and then you can skip the term pygmy quite easily. Mm -hmm. um, the the word or the name twa, which is so common right across the region. Uh, has been sort of claimed, at least by a linguist who did a study of its different, uh, or the different groups that use it, to mean the invisible people. Mm -hmm. And it's to do with the inability to find hunter-gatherers when, you, when you're looking for them, if they don't want you to be, uh, to find them. Um, anyway, but, uh, and, and the thing about economic designations for groups of people is that they're very common in the region. You know, Bambenga, which is one of the, the names used by other people to, to label these hunter-gatherers, actually means people of the spear. Yeah. And, and it's, it's quite common for people in this region to label each other economically uh, in terms of... So it's, it's not actually so unusual for people to do that. And of course, we do it in our own... Uh, society too, uh, in thinking that what you spend your time of uh, day doing does have an impact on how you understand your identity. So anyway, I, I just perhaps wouldn't worry quite so much as you did about that, but uh, just uh, remind people that we do it all the time. Anyway, but thank you. I, I want to leave the floor actually to other people, but I just wanted to make those couple of comments and thank you for another really uh, a very beautiful uh, explanation. I love your focus on noise. I think uh, you've really opened it up in some very nice ways. So really well done. Thank you so much, Jerome. I appreciate it. Um, Marco, do you want to go? Yeah, it was a really good talk. Really interesting. There's a lot of stuff going on in my head, um, uh, especially to do with how uh, those sorts of cultures relate to, um, you know, people in squatting communities, for example, or in, or in communes, uh, some some of it seemed kind of similar. But I was wondering, uh, in terms of decision making, um, are there any times when certain, you know, higher stakes um, decisions are delegated to people who, who might be more confident about uh, solving the issues? Or is it always uh, just generally direct democracy sort of thing i would say that uh, there are uh, thank you thank you uh, marco for your question um i think that you know generally within the community everybody knows about you know different characteristics characteristics and roles and possibilities and skills of people so there is no need to you know push something over to people i mean 
there is some sort of um I, what i felt from my own experience it felt as if people assume that this person would do it without asking because that's what he likes to do certain people like and prefer to do certain actions i don't remember any like direct assignment on any role um there could be there could be a discussion like um uh, there was a, I'm not doing it, <laughs> but I, uh, I don't think, I don't, I cannot recall any instance that somebody would say, oh, you should do this because uh, you do this kind of thing. So I, I wouldn't say, but of course there are differences in people's preferences, skills, and so on. People don't, um, it's not allowed to talk uh, about it really, like who is good at what, but, um, um, that is a kind of a silent expectation, I would say. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> um, who's run it? Do you want to go? Sure, that, that was great talk. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question. Uh, would you say there's an element that these performances create the norms as much as they reinforce them? So like in that, I'm trying to refer to the idea that as much as their performances, they're also performative. Um, so like by repeating, or like by getting up and making these speeches, people are actually like telling people, wait, this is the actual norm, as opposed to it actually being there uh, uh, in reality. Thank you, that's a wonderful question. That's, uh, I think there would be a potential for it. The question is what others would, how others would react because the norms are, you know, Sometimes we, we cannot verbalize, uh, we cannot verbalize uh, every norm, of course, but we, we can feel that certain things are not feeling right. And if they don't feel right, and I can imagine that uh, people would interfere with it. But what can happen, what I can imagine can happen, is that if we would take Mosambo uh, into a city, for example, that it, let's say that a community, uh, a group of Bayaka moved for some reason or another to a town. There could be different uh, different issues to deal with, and I can imagine Mosambo and Moajo too could be um, could be to a certain degree essential to creating versions of rules of new rules how to be behave in novel situations. I can imagine that, but I don't have that experiences, so I cannot give you a concrete example. But there could be this sort of potential. I can imagine. Or a completely new, imagine that completely new social situation would emerge. For example, a school was built in the in the in the village where I where I did the research, and the school started uh, just two months after my arrival. So it was a new thing, but it wasn't uh, all altogether a uh, new thing in the area. So um, I just I'm just thinking out loud. No, but I, I cannot say a concrete example. No, sorry. Okay. Um, we've got uh, Helena. Go. Hello, hello, Dasha. I'm Hi, Helena. I'm so happy to listen to you. I was not able to attend Dasha's lecture in Bratislava, but I can do it now. So I have uh, one question. Also, I, I was puzzled by the puzzled, uh, fascinated by the concept of noise. That the opposition you gave to it was not silence, but slowing down slow down if you could elaborate more on, on the, these two no, i was actually thinking the other day about because i'm trying to write a paper or I, it's just kind of a skeleton of a thoughts on the noise and what i'm thinking about is that um you know if to draw on oppositions i'm not sure if that's the right way but certainly I, I gave example of slowing down, but maybe it's not the precise, um, I have a concrete example of a like a expression, which is namana, which is an instruction that uh, people say, hey, namana, like I translated the slow down, but it's a not a good translation, I think. It says like, hey, hey do it properly. <laughs> it doesn't have to apply for the speed of the action or I just, I just usually remember it from the field in a context where children were really noisy and I said, hey, hey, like slow down. But it, it can be used in different contexts. I would, for example, I, I for example, got upset uh, with my informant, uh, Buma, and uh, her husband came to me and he said, Namana, like slow down. 
or like come on like you know like relax like you know this is not the right way how to deal with it because I could really I, I burst it uh, emotionally I started to shout at uh, her and so on so I didn't control myself and I you know I was I, I was I overreacted or I don't know I did too much <laughs> So, uh, if, uh, if, you, if you mentioned properly, does it mean that it refers to order? I, um, I wouldn't call it order. I, it's just that to do things in the right way. It's just hard to say uh, what's the right way sometimes. But I would say like you, you do, did something in a wrong way or wrong place or in a wrong time or wrong speed or something. Something is not right. And uh, they, don't, they don't tell. It's not... It's not verbalized. What exactly did you say wrong? It's just they let you know it's wrong. Then it's just up to you to figure out. <laughs> If I may elaborate a little bit further, uh, do they have concept of right, like we do, the right thing to do? Uh, also connecting with with the right in the sense of really literally right and left. I, I'm not sure if I understand uh, what you're asking. So if they have some sort of, uh, could you please again? Let's speak in Slovak. <laughs> oh, uh, the concept of being right, uh, also being, uh, of uh, saying the truth, like to 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 have that kind of, okay. Yes. <laughs> oh, like uh, I am right, you are not right, yes. or you're wrong. Yes, yes, yes. That's um, what. I wouldn't say that the, uh, linguistically it will be uh, interpreted that way. I would say like. Don't behave like this because these non bayaka behave like that. I would say this is how it would be verbalized. Okay, thank you. Um, Chris, you're going to go. <clears throat> yes, I, I, I mean, that, that was just um, really, really uh, wonderful. <laughs> as Camilla says, we could have listened to you for another hour or two. <laughs> thank you. Um, And, and as Jerome said, especially your, your culmination, the, the whole concept of um, noise. Um, I haven't exactly got a question, except uh, um, I, I just, I, I suppose I, the question is following on from Helenka's. It's just, um, it's so interesting that um, noise is the sort of antithesis of um, harmony, plenty, abundance, doing things properly. And the opposite of all that stuff is, noise. I, I, I imagine as well um, noise is the opposition is the opposite of um, a pro proper pro polyphonic singing but, uh, but but of course you made, you made it very clear that noise doesn't have to be audible you can be you can be noisy in all kinds of <laughs> other, other ways as, as well as with sound. Um, I, I suppose my just my observation is of course that uh, the category of noise is of huge significance in mythology, in, in particular Claude Lévi-Strauss's mythologique. Noise there in, in the raw and the cooked mm -hmm. is, the, uh, is the antithesis of cooking. So noise, m you, you might be wanting to cook your meat, and that means making sure that the blood, the visible blood is removed from the flesh. And if you make any noise in so many cultures that Lévi-Strauss deals with, what's going to happen is that the blood's going to start bubbling up until it eventually extinguishes the fire. And, and of course, in Aboriginal Australia, I'm, I'm very, very familiar with the idea that noise arouses it, the anger of the rainbow snake. A, li a little child crying can just get the rainbow snake to flood the whole, the whole area. So it's, a, it's an absolutely fascinating topic, and I'm so glad you've, you, you've mentioned it. And it's something which I think probably, I, I did mention to you before you started, um, that Jerome and I are supposed to be, well, we are, <laughs> writing this book about the origin of language, relying largely on Mojo and all these things. And so far, we haven't really discussed noise, which is terrible, because clearly it's, uh, it's an absolutely necessary in order to understand kind of the, you know, what, what, what language is, what music is, what harmony is, what abundance is, what all the, all the positive aspects of egalitarianism is, to know that the antithesis of that is noise seems absolutely, um, necessary so so thank you so much <laughs> can, I, can i react to that please <laughs> thank, thank you thank you for this comment it's uh, absolutely amazing i will definitely dig down to levi strauss again after many many years and i will have a i will have a proper look and also that's wonderful that you want to include noise uh, in your book that i think it's uh, it's important but when you were when you were talking about this what i what i just recalled is that 
noise is not only sound. Mm -hmm. Noise, uh, noise, uh, you know, attrib one of the attributions of noise is, for example, it can be allocated to uh, uh, space, a physical space. For example, to the village. Village is an open space and it's a noisy space. It, uh, it's a noisy place mm. and it's also a hot place. Noise mm. can be hot and painful too. Mm. And, uh, and there's this opposition again, like typical forest, which is cool and calming mm. and non-noisy. That's mm. why also when there is a lot of noise and this is in conversations like, oh my God, we need to go to the forest. Uh, there is too much noise here. I mean, let's go to the like calm place and resolve our issues. So this is also kind of a unifying concept of problem solving too. I mean, calming, non-noisy, um, calm, cool forest that resolves noise. <laughs> yeah. What, what happens when there's a clap of thunder when you have a storm? Um, is I mean, I just I'm just wondering in terms of kind of mythological connections between different types of noise, whether audible or not. I'm, I'm wondering whether you can say anything on that. I don't remember. Um, I, I cannot recall. Maybe Jerome can help me if he if he does. But I don't recall this to be referred to by noise. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a mbua, mbula. Mm -hmm. so, um, I, don't, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, I can. Um, I mean, I think this is very interesting. And, and, you know, noise is absolutely central to the way that people discuss whether things are how they should be. Um, but uh, but mutoko is really the opposite, it's disorder. It's, uh, it's when things are just cacophonic. And so when people are singing, it's harmonious. And, and that's how noise should be. Even when people have conversations, they don't just chat randomly. They really harmonize with one another and make all these special noises to show that they're listening to to demonstrate that they've understood or what their emotional response is to the speaker's words. And so there's always a tunefulness to conversations and that tunefulness is part of this sort of uh, ideology of noise or sound in fact. And so, I mean, I think that the opposite to motoko as far as I understand it is the sort of- Jerome? Yeah, I'll just go in the other room where we're closer. So the opposite of mutoko is harmonious sounds. It's the sounds of joy, of, of people having tuneful conversations, of singing together. It's all those sounds where people are coordinating and cooperating with one another. And, the, and, and, and that's why the opposite of, of mutoko in terms of sound is puite, which is a, just a calm, peace. It's, uh, it's that sort of it's what happens when you're in big forest and there's nothing, you're just in a very calm, peaceful sense. And, and one man pointed to a little bird in a tree when I was asking about Motoko and he said, look at that bird. It's just chirruping for joy. It's just so happy. That's what keeps the forest open. That's what, why the bird's singing. And, uh, and it's the same thing and with people. The forest is actively listening to the sounds of camp to determine if it's a good camp and if the forest should stay open to it. And, and as Dasha says, and I think what you really pointed out very elegantly, Dasha, is the extent to which motoko is a really nice substitute for moralizing, you know, uh, telling people off. It's, it's something which you can refer to and everyone gets it. You know, it's an aesthetic sense. It's not something you have to start describing and becoming embroiled in some authoritative discourse. You say, Dika motoko, stop making that noise. And, and everyone gets it, you know, look, you're being an ass. stop it. Um, anyway, so, so anyway, that, that, that's, that's, um, yeah, and uh, just that, you know, Namana, sorry, Namana, I, I really do think it is slowly. Yeah, um, yeah I, I really do. Um, you use it so often in terms of when you're moving through the forest or, but, but the, the, the reason is that when you're agitated, uh, angry, uh, or otherwise upset, you tend to do things rapidly and with force and, and not necessarily in a considered way. And so the namana, when people are getting overexcited, is really part of, you know, slow down a bit so that you start thinking about what you're doing, you know, that you reflect a little bit because what you're doing is not right, you know, just take it a bit easy. Um, anyway, so it is about speed, but maybe the speed of churning in the head in that respect. 
oh. as opposed to the uh, speed of actual motion. Anyway, sorry, thanks, that was lovely. Oh, thank you, I'm writing it all down. <laughs> Um, Elena, do you want to go? Yes, hold on. I, I will just, okay. Oh, Elena, yes. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Dasha. Um, I'm not going to talk about noise, but what struck me um, was your coalitionary MOA job, because my research was uh, in collectives of women sharing cosmetics, and a lot of aspects that you have listed there um, correspond to what I found in my research environment, which is contemporary Slovakia, Bratislava. Um, for example, well, apart from collective beautification and sharing of cosmetics, always complaints about men, they men, husbands, boyfriends, um, collective gossiping, talking about the third party, which could be maybe seen as a version, maybe a weakened version of what you found uh, in the coalition in Moajo, but also um, monitored and expected sharing, often on demand of cosmetics. So that was very interesting for me that um, the mechanisms of your collective Moajo um, kind of work um, in a contemporary um, industrial Slovakia amongst women um, and their cosmetic rituals. So thanks. Thank you, Elena. I see a potential for a future paper. So me <laughs> and Camila should get together and think of something, definitely. I think that's a good idea. Looking forward to it. <laughs> me too. Thank you. Uh, uh, can, can I come in uh, just after that? Um, because when I was reading Dasha's thesis, there were so many powerful ideas that, that could be brought out and developed. I mean, just here tonight, um, your phrase about trying to call these societies hunting and mothering societies was, uh, we could say grandmothering too, perhaps, but hunting and mothering is just such a, that's such a beautiful, um, little idea to to think about, but you really have produced um, one of the key ethnographies for reverse dominance, for actually understanding the means and mechanisms of reverse dominance. This is an idea which Christopher Bohm had and has been very influential, but Christopher Bohm was never producing a very good example because he was kind of looking at the wrong gender. He was just looking in the wrong direction. And, and you've been able to show us the intricate mechanisms of, by which women are creating these, well, able to produce these mirrors for people to see themselves as others see them. And um, this of course could be, so Moajo can be related potentially or some form of Mwajo can be related potentially to the whole evolution of intersubjectivity. So it can be related to Sarah Hardy's ideas very, very powerfully. Um, so this is just so, so important. There's so many beautiful examples. Uh, the example with, um, is it Afele, who, who's talking about her husband who smells bad because, because he can't find the meat but as soon as he brings meat, he's so attractive, all of that. Um, but I, I really think um, Elena Ellie's right about the, the whole thing about the cosmetics. And, and Dasha, you've, you've got this material about the women's intimacy and the way they're sharing cosmetics and the way they're beautifying each other and empowering each other is just so different from any idea about female competition to look more beautiful and grab the man. Um, it's yeah. just so different, uh, evidently. And we really have to bring, bring that to a much wider audience, which I hope your book will be doing. Um, but yes, I think we could develop articles with Elena, with Mona, yeah. um, for sure, for sure. Um, and, and I'm sure you've got many more more thoughts on on this whole topic.
but yeah it's actually good to meet up and talk about it more in detail maybe go through more we, we really really do um on zoom but actually physically i don't know if you're getting to ireland at all but uh, but um i have done, like sure. three presentations or so but i i need to i i i uh, i will be there only online but i'm thinking that i should get there because it's going to be quite crucial for you know i think you should yes yeah yeah definitely great great yeah. okay um and yeah and that that's the hunter gatherer conference but yeah we need to talk with with ellen as well okay um marco you've been waiting with your hands up so go and then after that uh lieta if, if ellen is having that yeah i was just thinking also um about when you said that uh, there's, there's a lot of sharing going on, but I was curious if you also observed any form of debt systems or uh, any uh, any concept of, of credit, um, not just on, on material uh, goods, but also more metaphysical um, uh, ideas, you know, like blood debt, uh, birth debt, uh, maybe even when you get married. If there's some kind of exchange there again materially but also conceptually yeah um thank thank you marco this is this is something that uh, jerome has published a lot on but if i can just a few few words about it there are different rules when it comes to sharing knowledge uh, or um, um apply someone's skills to you know by helping someone on demand there are different ways of sharing uh, material uh, things like tools. There are different ways of sharing meat. There is a different uh, type of sharing when uh, just, you know, yams are brought in, you know. So it really depends also on what is being shared. There are also, um, I, I don't think I can, you know, you know, you know, tell about the, the whole thing now, but um, when it comes to, for example, people's expertise, it is not for free and not on demand to share just like that. I mean, people can do that. You might be, for example, if you are you are an expert in making videos um, and I might um, ask you to do a video on my presentation, but um, you can do it either that you would ask me like, OK, so give me rights to your photos and I will make that video or you can uh, say okay i'm uh, sure I will, I will do it and i'm fine so there could happen this it depends on the the person who has that expertise and also when it comes to expertise it's also um linguistically uh, people refer to it as some sort of uh guardianship i mean it's not as if uh it, it belongs only to the individual that that skill it's Yes, it, people know that this person is good at something, but it doesn't mean it, it's, it's also for the good of the community. This is especially, for example, um, for specialists in, I don't know, healing, marital relationship problems, or, you know, um, different categories of sorcery. I mean, I don't even want to start that because I don't know much about it. I, I think Jerome can uh, jump in and say something, but I mean, there are different different ways of of sharing and that's like a huge huge topic that uh, still i think needs to be developed further um yeah i don't know if i answered your question i, I would need much more time and i don't know <laughs> sorry yeah, i'm coming into this totally ignorant so i don't know who knows oh. what i just figured yeah no I but thank that, thank you though i hope that at least something you brought from yeah 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 okay Hi, hi, Dasha. Thank you so yeah. much. That was uh, oh, yes. that was amazing. Um, I, I sort of I took a while to raise my hand because I was I was actually looking a couple of things up. Your your thing about noise, this sort of translated metaphor. Well, I'm Italian, and we actually have something extremely similar. Uh -huh. But I was looking up etymologies before raising my hand because I thought, okay, so I don't know whether this is relevant at all, but we have. Um, a word that originally is called it's casino, not as in casino where you it, it eventually went into where you play, you know, poker and whatever. But it, it started 
as uh, just a simple house that noble people would uh, build to go hunting and to play cards and basically do things that were really out of the ordinary and and do naughty things and meet their mistresses and do you know so it has an element of stuff that is not ordinary and then it it eventually it became also a, a word to designate a, um, a house where prostitutes would be but now it is used um in a noise context so you would say oh my god a casino like what a casino there is it's like it's too much it's too much noise and also um when you're out of kilt and you're like in your life you're completely your life is upside down and whatever you say that you're in casinato or that your house is in casinato that it's it's sort of it's it's sort of so it's this noise matter and instantly when you were talking about it, it's like hang on a minute i i know this this is very similar so i don't know whether it's relevant at all and whether in other you know there are other languages in which this has happened but it, we've got a you know again a translated metaphor that has gone into noise but that it started from doing things that were either naughty or out of the ordinary or things that are not, you know, certainly not normal activity. And certainly to do with stuff, you know, again, with, with having, you know, with, with prostitution or, or, or um, illegal gaming and that kind of uh, thing. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm now really curious to pursue this. <laughs> Thank you, Rita. This is this is absolutely wonderful and, <laughs> and very inspiring. I will definitely check all all languages um, to, to see uh, to see if there is some if something like this is yeah. going. I'll just put the the word is I'll just go uh, is uh, casino. Uh, but we also say I am you know I am in casinato yeah. or gosh my life is so in casinato at the moment and it's sort of everything is out out of you know. But it means noise, like the children are making a lot of casino, like there's a lot of, you know. <laughs> so thank you, you know, for, for making me make this, you know, this, this. Um, thank you. Yeah. This, is, this is wonderful. <laughs> Very inspiring. Jacob. Jacob. Yes. Um, thank you. This has been a, a fabulous talk. Um, I, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and uh, being in the forest, it's, um, it's always surprising just how much sound there is. Uh, but then there's a point at which uh, there's too much sound, which is terrifying because um, it's, uh, it's violence or, or the sound of some, something being harmed. Uh, but the other, thing, uh, the other thing that's terrifying is uh, silence because it's usually an indication that there's a bear uh, mm -hmm. or a human uh, that, that doesn't know the rules of the forest. But when the prey animals go quiet or get really loud, your body feels that something's wrong. And so it's finding that balance of like dropping the city and coming into harmony with the forest. Uh, it's very, very strong, um, very, very strong in the talk. I had two questions um, about Masambo and Mwajo and whether they're strictly in group um, uh, behaviors and whether that not they would ever be employed with the Bantu farmers or whether it would, would they would be used against um the state because uh, but like in rag we're always kind of hinting at what mwajo would mean for us in the streets um and it but it seems like masambo and mwajo would there are things with, that we do in our village and our community and that when the others come something else happens or we move away um so i, I would wonder the context um with the out group and also um I believe there was a time when Ngoku almost was stopped performed by the women and there was uh, a push for the, uh, I think Ingrid was a big part of pushing for the Ngoku to continue. And I was wondering what the pressures, if you knew what the pressures were that almost stopped that um, and what were the, uh, the ways in which it was fostered. Um, and then a little bit of background, I work in the theater uh, so a lot of these behaviors are very, very much a part of what we do in rehearsal and how we behave. Mm -hmm. um, but there is far more theory and structure in what you've given, which I'm thrilled for. Um, but there are times when we're not sure <laughs> where these behaviors, who, who we should be talking to and when, uh, when we need to be in different coalitions and what pressures make us quiet. So. Okay. 
So um, for your first question, when it comes to um, applications of Mosambo and Moajo in different contexts uh, with, for example, non-Bayaka groups, I would say like this, when there are meetings held uh, with uh, you know, non-Bayaka, they are done in a very, very different way. I mean, if, I don't think that if Mosambo would be used the same as in the context uh, among Bayaka, that these people would be heard among the non-Bayaka. So non-Bayaka usually imagine in the village. So the same thing, if, if it would be discussed or a similar thing, if it would be discussed um, uh, with the non-Bayaka, there would be a proper seating area. It would be very ceremonial. People would, uh, there would be uh, seating areas for different people according to hierarchy within the village. There would be place for chief, there would be place for this person. There would be, for example, for Baya County that they stand in front uh, of the chief or in front of everyone and everybody was kind of making that kind of pressure. Like they are, or, or it's, a, it's a feeling like when you're at the court and you're being judged in a way. So I don't think that Mosambo would be in any ways powerful uh, that, in that kind of context, I don't think they would be listened to. Uh, I think they would, uh, it, it just just doesn't work. Uh, I, I don't see it this way, I, I don't think so. But um, among Bayaka, sometimes when there is a really, really terrible issue going on, for example, there's a peak conflict with the non-Bayaka, Bayaka are also uh, capable, they, they do sometimes these elinos, which is like a Council. They also sit, there will be a group of women on the one side, there will be a group of men on the other, and they would discuss and there would be a series of mosambos in more kind of formalized way that it would be like, um, that it wouldn't be animated like you are speaking now and, you know, welcome. No, it would be, it would be also like whoever wants to speak out speaks out, but it would be like there would be a group of men, group of women uh, with children, and there would be like a series of mosambos to, to resolve the issue. When it comes to Moajo, I actually remember when I uh, joined women in doing Moajo in the village. And I remember uh, uh, being taken and called by the chief of the village later and I said like, you are, uh, this is, uh, he said like, you are uh, acting very dirty. Like this is not, this is, uh, this is not right. I mean, you came here to study, you should behave properly. Like this is, this is not how women should behave. I was stunned and uh, quite scared because their words are sometimes a very, sound very powerful. Uh, usually they, they just stay with words, but they, they make you feel really scared. And I stopped doing it in the village. That's how I felt uh, threatened. So I mean, I did it in the village, but not when they saw me. And uh, so it doesn't work outside of the context, I think, but uh, I, I am not the one who could tell definitely that it cannot be possible, but that's my that's my view. And now when it comes to fostering and stopping the group, uh, I think silence would be to stop it. So no reaction of the audience, like no disattachment, um, disattachment from what's going on, from the performance, stopping paying attention, not any reaction, not joining in, not clapping, not interjecting with sounds, uh, I think silence would be the way to, to stop it. And promoting is very uh, active. Um, sometimes I saw, for example, that there would be women who would take on the role for a while, say, do it like this, and then go back to the role of audience and encourage them to continue. So this is, for example, how to foster it. Uh, or they would say just uh, again, like do it again, you know, like when the performance is, for example, short and they want to continue to laugh. Uh, I'm thinking what else could be fostering further. Uh, sometimes they would, uh, I, 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 I remember, for example, that one would do it and then they would say, okay, now another one does it. And they were changing, for example, and they, it was fun. Or for example, they encouraged a child to do it. Like, okay, come on, like now you girls do it. You do it, no, you do it like this. And they would, they would just, they would uh, grab their hands or move and position their body to, to, do, to do it in certain ways. Um, so also age can and can matter to I think we need I wonder I think uh, encouragements are very loud and this encouragement is being quiet and disinterested that's how I would I would say thank you so much Dasha yeah. it's been a most wonderful evening it's been so great to see you again and hear you um, 
I, I'm just going to say quickly for everybody here, um, next week, RAG is taking a break. We don't have a seminar next week. Um, it's also Dark Moon, so that's part of the reason. Uh, we're coming back in two weeks when Chris Knight is going to give us a history of the menstrual hut. Um, so please, everybody, come back for that. But like, I think everybody wants to say thank you tonight for Dasha's fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, much. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I, I hope that uh, we can you know, do this every year, <laughs> that I will not miss out on more of this. Uh, and it was so mm. lovely to see you. I appreciate everything you have done for me. Or for me I would actually say. Thank you so much. You. So I, I have to see if uh, they will did they, they didn't lock me out at the office uh, if I can get out <laughs> to get out to see your to find your child. Yes. Yeah. Good night. Good luck with that.